Um, before anything, I want to do a quick round of. Um, I have. Oh, I had the PDF. Yay! <laughs> um, first of all, is there anyone not here? Raise your hand if you're not here. Huh? Brent is not here. Yeah, I got an email from him just before I came here, so that's all right. Um, let's do a little bit of um, like, um, what's that? <laughs> Have you, are these all old? Um, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing people's names right. Is it Rui? Yeah. Did I say that right? Yeah. Rui? Okay. And I don't think it tells me uh, nicknames here. So some of you might have, uh, I think some of you, I'll have to be reminded. Okay. Rui. Um, Bora. Over there. Rui. Bora. Um, Kunjung. Is she here? Not here? Okay. Um, Brent is not here. Um, Chunhan. I said that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Casey. All right, um, Ada. Okay, uh, Becca over here. Um, so let me just uh, Roy, Bora, Injun. Um, this will take me a while, but I'm trying to do better than I did last semester, which was not very good. So um, where am I? Ada, Becca, Abby, over there. Hello, um, Daphne. <laughs> Daphne. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, well, first of all, they're all, I think they're all like squeezed vertically. So I don't know. It looks like my passport picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It probably is, right? Um, uh, Shingyu? Shingyu? Ah, hi, what's it? Elvin. Elvin. Okay. I'll have to remember. Elvin. Elvin. Okay. Jordan. Is Jordan here? Okay. Detention. Um, Stefan, I right hear. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, it is. But that's you. Um, Eileen. Eileen. No, Eileen. Okay. Um, uh, Nuntini. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty good at um, pronouncing names, but not at remembering them. That's the. Um, Ali Zarin? Did I say that right? Okay, Ali Zarin. <laughs> how would you how would you say it? Ali Zarin, just a different emphasis, different cadence. Ali Zarin. Um, and uh, Jingyu? Jingyu? Sorry. Oh, he'll figure it out soon enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is there in Jingyi? I said that right. Okay. And um, Tianyi? I also go by letter T. T. Okay. T. Um, T. Elvin. And then everyone else, there's no nicknames. And then Jordan. Yes. Okay. Um, is there anyone who's, uh, who's not on this list who's here? Everyone's registered now, right? Nobody's here at wait list or auditing? Okay. Cool. Um, okay, so I guess the only people missing are Brent and Kunjung. Yeah, is that correct? And then did I miss anybody? Anyone else here? All right, great. Um, we can we can kind of begin. Uh, let's go to the slides. Okay, um, so let me just make sure I have everything straight. I'm recording and um, and. Oh, and, and actually, one thing I want to do before getting into the slides is, if the sometimes uh, I, we need to download some stuff, and so because the downloads might take a long time, I want to just do that now. Um, so, if everyone can please go to the following website, let's do this. Um, actually, uh, go to GitHub.com/ml4a. So this. And then in here you'll see the link for ML4A OFX, or you go straight, to, or you go just straight to ML4A ML4A OFX. And then what I'd like for you to do is, when you get to this web web page, you don't even have to sign in if you don't want. Um, for for anyone who's using Open Frameworks, you might want to consider even um, 
uh, cloning this and then maybe you can even build some of the examples but for now we'll just download the release so go to the where it says three releases you see this three releases link so click on that and then the top link right here says ml for a-ofx plus osc modules so i want you to click into there and then um, you should find if you scroll down you'll see this under assets it says ml for a-ofx dot zip it's 158 megabytes so please click on that and download it just like that okay and it hopefully it goes by pretty quickly but maybe if 20 of us are downloading at the same time it might get slower i don't know um but uh please download that and um how many has anyone here down uh, has everyone downloaded runway we did that last week right yeah. okay so everyone has uh, has runway has everyone registered for runway anyone not do that yet okay cool that's that's really good um, if, if you haven't done that then please go to runwayapp.ai um, or actually runway it doesn't matter either one runwayml.com or runwayapp.ai so if you go to runwayml.com and then click if you haven't done this already it seems like most people have click download beta and then it should download to your machine and as I recall uh, most people have Macs. There's one window, one PC, two PCs, um, three PCs. Is that right? Um, Elvin, yeah, that's a PC. Oh no. Oh, it's a Mac. Okay. Okay. So we have two PCs. Um, you guys are both on Windows, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's that's fine. Um, there's a like one annoying thing about Windows is if unless you have Windows Professional, then you can't uh, run Docker. And if you can't run Docker, then you can't run runway models uh, locally. You can run them in the cloud, so that's fine. We'll be just running from the cloud, but just a limitation to be aware of. And, uh, there is a way around that. Apparently, you can, there are if you look it up on the internet, there are ways of installing Docker in Windows Home. You have to do some hackery stuff. Um, I don't use Windows, so I can't really help too much with that. Hello. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and then and then the other thing is. Um, for you guys on Windows, the ML4A-OFX uh, thing is just, on, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's just for Mac. So um, that's okay. Like, I'm just going to be showing people. It's not mandatory to use it. I'm just going to be showing people a bunch of different tools. And so those are ones that you just won't be able to use. You could use other tools, though, so don't worry about it too much. Um, okay. So so everyone, did everyone download the ML4A-OFX quickly? It kind of came through pretty quick, yeah? Everyone found that? Yeah? Well, we don't need it to run Windows, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, unless you can build it on Windows, uh, or some, some of it. It's, some of it is not very easy to build on Windows, so I, unless you're using Open Framework. So I would, sorry? Um, you don't need to for now. We'll, don't worry about it for now. Yeah. Um, OK. So back to the slides. Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to divide this class into two. Um, the first half today, and I'm going to try to fit it all into the first half, like before lunch, is going to be just a lecture about neural networks and how they work. Um, and then talk about transfer learning also, which is going to be part of the lecture. And then in the second half of the lecture, we're going to be doing, uh, I'm going to, oops, I'm going to show you actually, there's one more thing I want to add here. I'll also show you ML for AOFX. Basically, the second half of today, I'm going to show a whole bunch of tutorials of practical tools that let us do neural network stuff, uh, basically interactive neural network stuff. Um, so roughly speaking, the first half of the, the class is kind of oriented around small neural networks that can run interactively. So things like on open frameworks and also ML5 um, and, and a fair amount of runway. And then in the second half of this course, like later in the semester, we'll talk more about things like GANs and things that you have to train for a long time. Um, that's roughly, roughly the way things are done. And I, I have a feeling that I probably won't, be, won't have enough time to show all of these today. It's probably gonna spill over into, into next week, but I'm going to, basically my goal is to do everything as fast as possible. Um, and the reason why, as fast as possible because I'm recording it and so if I go fast on something you can always download the lecture 
and then put me on half speed, you know, <laughs> something like that. And um, um, yeah, so so a, a, and a lot of these like they are a little bit like you know instead of me kind of doing step by step, I'll just show you them and then you can do them step by step later because they're pretty easy to set up, but but there's no reason to. You know, we have this lecture time, we should kind of be efficient at it, yeah. Um, yeah, so basically, second half today, tutorials. First half, lecture. And this is called a brain bow. Has anybody ever seen a brain bow before? It's this um, imaging technique that stains neurons um, so that they come out this really neon sort of fluorescent color. Uh, it's really, really kind of neat technique uh, from neuroscience. And um, neural networks are, of course, inspired by neuroscience in, in some very loose way. We'll kind of get into that. A um, couple of things about admin. So we just did the whole roster thing. I have, I have all of that kind of sorted, and I'll try to learn your names um, as much as I can. Um, and then, yeah, there's no more auditors, I guess. Uh, I guess everybody here is officially on the, in the class roster, so, um, so that's great. There's, um, yeah, but if people want to, I'm not supposed to say this, but if people want to sit here, just don't tell me, like, it's all good. <laughs> um, so, um, office hours. Um, so basically, I just got the office hours, like, literally an hour ago onto the, it should be available through ITP, so you should be able to book it. But basically, I'm just going to be kind of roughly trying to do my office hours Wednesdays, 1 to 6. I'm also on the floor, um, I'll be on the floor, like, other days as well like I'll probably be on the floor a lot on Mondays and Fridays as well and so um, Monday ones yeah probably like a mon Monday probably most days I'll be here basically so if you f if you find me and I'm in my office you can you can kind of just come in also because uh, but but the thing is that some days I won't be and so like Wednesday is the day that you can reliably plan reliably plan if that's what you need um, we're going to do a midterm project that's going to be kind of like the and, I, and I've decided to schedule that on October 22nd. The way this will be is that um, we'll have class for the first six weeks. This is now week two. And then um, then we don't have class the following week, which which would be October 15th because it's a Monday schedule. And I will actually be away uh, for the two weeks leading up to October 22nd. And so basically when I come back, um, I'm just gonna like we'll we'll just do midterm project presentations that day, and and, and maybe they may not even take the whole day. We'll kind of see how long. Um, we'll talk about that more when we get closer to it, basically. Um, and then the last thing is I'm gonna be trying to schedule an AI lab. Um, how many of you attended AI lab last semester at some point? Not too many of you. I was doing this kind of like a weekly meetup that's you know a little bit like this except much more informal and then having speakers sometimes and kind of doing like very random disconnected demos of things and talking about news and AI and stuff like that and so I'll be doing that again and I think it'll probably be on Fridays um, and last semester I was doing things like Fridays at 5 and so just look out for that that's kind of yeah okay let's get into the lecture so I'm gonna let's do a quick exercise um, I want you to look at this text here and I want you to memorize it um, and you have one minute um, and so at the end of one minute I'll take this off and then you all have to write it down and and this is your grade depends on it by the way um, and uh, don't like I know you'll make some mistakes so if you can just get 50% of it right you'll pass um, so so that's going to be pretty, okay, so you have one minute. Okay, go ahead, look at it really hard. Okay, so that would be really, really hard, right? But let's, let's do, let's, let's alter this exercise. Memorize this instead. Whoa, yeah. Um, so when you look at this, do you feel like this is easier to memorize than the thing before it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but why? I mean, it's the same amount of text, right? Like, there's less information uh, in, in some sense, yeah. You could compress it in a way, right? You can kind of like, you could think of it as there's a bunch of patterns. There's a certain kind of pattern going on here, right? 
and there's some noise in there you see random letters like W's and X's inside but there's a there's a consistent pattern there right so um, the what you just did was you formed you in your mind features right? and features is this kind of abstract somewhat abstract concept in machine learning um, which is the idea of patterns in data and the feature is not necessarily written down anywhere like explicitly it's implicit it's something that you can kind of like um, acquire you know by processing something um, and features kind of indicate higher level uh, higher level aspects of something you know so maybe in images features might be things like um, you know a color gradient or a corner or an object you know there's because because in an image all you get is pixels but a feature is kind of like patterns found in those pictures and our brains are really 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 good at um, extracting features from things um, I forget the I remember hearing a statistic like how much information your brain in megabytes let's say is is receiving from your senses all the time and you're receiving something like a hundred megabytes every second of in uh, of like pixels audio and um, you know basically pixels and audio maybe feel feelings and stuff um, I mean not, not I don't mean feelings but like touch you know <laughs> um, so a hundred megabytes a second or whatever it is I, it, I mean it's a thousand the point is it's a lot and um, of course you can't you have to discard that data it's impossible to make use of it and so what you do is you grab statistics from that from those hundred megabytes and save a lot less you kind of save a low resolution approximation of the information that you're receiving. So features are, um, you know, they're, they're patterns in data. And we, we talk, there's often a lot of talk about bias in machine learning, right? And bias is close, bias is just a type of feature that we don't like, basically. <laughs> so um, there's kind of this connection between those two, those two characteristics. So supervised learning. Um, so there's machine learning, as I mentioned last week, um, is there's kind of three branches of it, and we're going to talk today about supervised learning. And we're mostly going to approach it from a high level. We're just going to describe sort of what supervised learning is and what it does and what its applications are. And then next week, we're going to talk more about one specific aspect of supervised learning, which is training. But today, we're going to not focus on training. So the idea of supervised learning is that you're trying to learn a function which maps one kind of data into another kind of data. That's the most general way of putting it. Um, so when you, when you see a lot of demos in machine learning, they're usually, they can be described in this way, right? You have, for example, if you're trying to do image classification, you know, you put a, a hot dog in front of a camera and the camera tells you it's a hot dog, um, then, then this is what you're doing. X is the image, F is the function that takes the image, and tells you why, which is the label of hot dog or not hot dog, something like that. And um, the way that F is, is uh, created is basically by taking a training set, training data of a lot of pictures of hot dogs and pictures of not hot dogs, and then applying a learning algorithm to the training data in order to figure out what F should be. Um, and um, yeah, so then more specifically, the learning algorithm that is usually used almost entirely dominant in machine learning is gradient descent. And gradient descent is something that we'll talk about next week. Um, for today, you can assume that gradient descent is magic. Um, basically, um, yeah, it, it's just like we can figure out what F is and then it's just more or less magic. So some examples of, of uh, supervised learning. Image classification. You get an image, you have a series of categories like cat, dog, and piano, and your learning algorithm tells you this image is of a dog or a doge for those of you because <laughs> this is a doge. Um, and then there's regression, which is the same thing as classification except, except it's a continuous value, right? The difference between classification and regression is that in classification, you have a bunch of categories. There's no order to them cat, dog, piano, piano, dog, cat, whatever. Um, but then regression, you have a value that's continuous, an amount of something. 
And so that and so those are two sort of different kinds of outputs that you can have. The two outputs that you can have basically. Um, so for example, you know, image regression instead of classification might be like how much snow is inside of this picture. Um, which is actually a funny, funny, I haven't really seen this exactly, I'm sort of making it up, but um, but it, you know, in principle you could have something like this. Um, we talked about this briefly last week. Um, a, everyone has done um, machine learning if you have taken a introductory high school level statistics class. So if you've ever gotten a scatter plot of points and been asked to find the line of best fit, you know, a line that goes through the points and, and fits it, then that's called, that's regression. Um, and in, in, in particular, it's called linear regression because you're fitting a line. And um, so that's a very basic form of machine learning. And linear regression is actually, is pretty easy to understand. I think uh, uh, these slides, yeah. So like, okay, a, a line, right? Everyone learns what a line is. A line is an equation of the form y equals mx plus b, right? And the line can be, that's, that's if you have one dependent variable and one independent variable, right? Like a 2D plot, y equals mx plus b. But that can generalize instead of having uh, just a 2D plot, maybe you have a 3D plot. And so then you have two, um, two independent variables. So you could have um, a variable x, which is actually a vector of variables. And then you would have, instead of y equals mx plus b, you could say y equals m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus b so then you get you get this actually which is the equation of a plane right something like this um, and and this generalizes to as many dimensions as you want um, and, he, and actually here we're using w instead of m it's just a convention like when you're in grade school you use m but you'll see a lot w here because it stands for weights so but it's the same thing um, and so yeah, this is kind of the idea of a function, which, which um, well, it's just a function, right? It, all it is is a linear function, and it's a, it's a generalization of a line. So in a neural network, this is the building block of a neural network. It's a simple function that basically, that you can, you can kind of, where's my mouse? <laughs> I, does anyone know how to, how to make Keynote? show the mouse there's like a setting it's got to be in preferences right because i really like to use the mouse um slideshow enable um no show pointer yes this right i think that's correct yes Wonderful. Okay. Um, I know it's not super super big. Also, double check that your screen capture program is set to include the pointer. Oh, really? Yeah, some of them hide the pointer. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I think it it does, but if not, then whatever. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So so you can think of you know you can think of it this way, and you'll see this kind of a diagram a lot in machine learning. You know, this is this is basically a function that shows. Okay, you have two dependent variables. They get weighted by some connection represented by this line. So it's be like x1 times w1. w1, it's not labeled, but okay. x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2 plus b equals y. And then this is an equation of a plane. And a plane is splitting a space into two halves. You know, so this is... This is kind of how you might think classification works. If the point is above the plane, then it's class A. If the point is below the plane, it's class B. So that's actually like a way of doing binary classification. Um, so, so yeah, and, and so one way of thinking of this, this is a neuron. And you'll see that neurons are the building blocks of neural networks, right? So, so there's that. Now here's the thing about regression, linear regression. It's really, really simple, like from a mathematical standpoint, but it's very limited because it's linear. Um, you might learn in math classes how there's this eternal um, trade-off between linear and nonlinear functions. Linear functions are very easy to solve analytically. 
We have everything we need to know to be able to solve linear functions and do a lot of things with them, but they're limited because they're linear. They're flat. They can't curve. They can't, they can't take on irregular shapes very easily. Nonlinear functions, um, which roughly means that they're not flat, and there's, there is a, like a, a formal mathematical explanation of it. We can ignore it more or less, but um, a, but basically nonlinear functions are not linear, of course. <laughs> but, um, but the paradox is that nonlinear functions are not easy to solve. And this is kind of like why machine learning is hard. And so um, solve analytically anyway. Um, and the way that we make linear regression nonlinear is that we take this, this uh, linear function, this f, e f equals or y equals w1x1 plus w2x2 plus b, and we add one more step to it, which is that we make it go through a nonlinearity. And in this case, we have this nonlinearity called a sigmoid function. And the sigmoid function takes whatever, like if we take the, before we had this thing, let's call it z now. We take it, we have z, and then we run z as the argument to this, 1 plus 1 over uh, one, one over one plus e to the negative z. Now the derivation of this is compl complicated. We don't need. We don't really. You can look it up. It's 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 enlightening, but we don't need to know why it works. The point is that it squashes a linear value to between zero and one, and it makes it curved. Kind of, it has this curved shape, and this simple thing actually makes the function number one not easily solvable anymore. But it makes it much more flexible, bendy. So now, instead of fitting a line to a set of points, you can fit a curve to a set of points. And that's useful because a lot of, a lot of things are shaped irregularly. You know, they're shaped in a cur curved way. And so it increases our, our ability to model things more accurately. And so this is kind of what happens. This is a, not a nonlinear neuron. Um, sigmoid function is kind of um, the original nonlinearity, the OG, let's say. But, um, but now, um, actually sigmoids are not used that much anymore in machine learning, but it's kind of, I start with it because it's the easiest one to understand. Actually, the funny thing is, we'll, we'll see later, I guess ReLU comes later. Um, okay, so now, um, now, imagine we take ne these neurons and we make a whole network of them in which you might have several layers and then uh, you have an input layer which is the first layer and that takes in your input variables and then you maybe have one or more hidden layers and hidden layer means just not input not output so we have one hidden layer here which is in the middle here it has some number of neurons and all of the neurons every neuron in one layer is connected to every neuron of the next layer and uh, that property is called fully connected. So there's no, there's no skipped connections here. Um, so that's called fully connected. And, um, and so now we have multiple functions which are then being added to each other, sort of recombined. Um, or you can think of it all as one function, right? Because one function can be just, you know, composite of many functions, right? Um, and so that's now we have a neural network. This is all a neural network is. And we're, we're going to see a simple version of this in a second, but it doesn't get much more complicated than this. All neural networks are actually like filled with simple operations, but in huge graphs like this. A and graphs which become more complicated than this because they won't be fully connected. They might have weird kinds of routings in them, let's say. Um, another nice analogy is to think of it as like an electric circuit, you know, so you have like a little component here which sends some current along this connection, this wire, to another neuron and the amount of current that it sends is modulated or regulated by the resistance of that wire and the resistance is roughly analogous to the weight of the connection or the coefficient in this function. So, um, yeah? Well, I have a really simple question. Mm -hmm. yeah. the arrow ever I'm sorry? Does the arrow ever ah. um, Sort of. So we'll, when we get into recurrent neural networks, you do have this kind of looping back, uh, but that won't be for a few more weeks. Uh, for, for most of these next few weeks, 
all of the neural networks we'll see are called feed forward and feed forward means that all of the signal always goes from one direction to the from from the beginning to the end basically forward only um, and uh, we'll get into non feed forward neural networks later in the semester yeah um, but that's actually that's a very good question in fact not a stupid one yeah so let's do a quick demo um, and you know, I, I probably this is probably like maybe more detailed than than you really need, but I like to show this because it's kind of you know. Well, I made this demo a while ago, so we got to use it for something. That's fine. Um, I'm just kidding. I think it's actually useful. So imagine that we have a data set where we first of all we have a a problem, which uh, we have a function that we're trying to fit, which maps a three-dimensional input variable to a one-dimensional output variable. So x is 1.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, that's our data set, and it has some label y equals 0 0.58. I know this is abstract because we don't have an actual task here yet, but um, you'll see that all tasks boil down to something that can, can be represented this way. x is a multidimensional vector, a bunch of numbers that represent something, and y is some value that, you know, some output. So the amount of rain, let's say or the temperature or you know some, something like that so we can fit a neural network we can we can try to model the relationship between x and y with a neural network and that neural network has only one two constraints it, or one constraint basically it has to have three input neurons and one output neuron and then everything else in between is you know is up to the 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 programmer to desi decide maybe we have two hidden neurons, maybe we have multi maybe we have five hidden layers, maybe we have 16 hidden neurons, whatever. But the point is that um, if we're trying to model this, we need to have three inputs and one output. And we want to set these connections, these W's and the B's, you know, these and B stands for bias. And, and bias, that doesn't mean bias in like the way that we usually, it's just, it's a technical term, like an addition, basically. Um, and um, we need to figure out what these W's and B's should be such that when the, the signal propagates, this X propagates, we get this Y roughly. Now let's suppose we pick the W's randomly. So these are all random W's and B's. If we do this process, right, um, we set these all randomly and then we input our variable 1.1.1.1 and then the it, it the calculation goes exactly as we saw in the slides, right? It's 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 just the um, it's just this, right? For each one, so if we do this, we would say okay, one point one times negative one, point one times point six, negative point one times point one, add those up, add this b, and then run it through a sigmoid function, and then you get point twelve. And then do that for this neuron, you get 0.69. And then you do it again for this connection. And then you get 0.24. Now, um, I've already forgotten what the actual Y was, but it wasn't 0.24. Um, the actual Y was 0.58, and we have 0.24. And so we have the wrong answer. What we would like to have is the right answer. Um, and so, which means we need to change the W so that we get the right answer. Now, the question is, how do we know how wrong it is? So one thing you could do is just take the, the subtract, subtraction, the difference between them, um, and then there's there's various ways of measuring it. One that you'll come you'll see a lot is called mean squared error. Mean squared error, um, and, and actually in this case there's no mean; it's just the squared error because there's only one um, value. But but okay, like mean squared error says subtract the difference between the value that you got and the value that you're that you want to get and then square it and then squaring it gets rid of the, the the negative right so you just get a positive no matter what it is it's just like the absolute value squared basically um, yeah so my, my question yeah um, I might be getting ahead here but like I know as we're doing the learning algorithm we're basically going to be adjusting the doubles and means, right mm -hmm. what's the advantage of having a B and a W like if you if, if if that top if the top learn and that middle layer, if you want it to be you know to count more, 
why you need, if you wanted to count more, you could increase the B, or you could increase the W going to the mm -hmm, next layer. Mm -hmm. Is there a method of advantage of having both of those? So um, let, let's, let's e think about it in, in terms of linear regression. Let's say you're trying to, oh, do, there's no whiteboards here, are there? Or is there a whiteboard? Uh, yeah. Oh, OK, right. yeah. Hey, let's, this is, this is a great square, good question. So I'll show you, actually. Oh, this won't be in the video, so unfortunately. But where's the maybe in that dish? Uh, yes. So I'm allowed, this is not permanent. I can, I can yeah. draw this. Yeah. Um, yeah, right, okay. Cool. <laughs> it really looks like a wall. It's just like, this is not a whiteboard. It's just, so uh, here's your, imagine you have this, right? And you're trying to do like a linear regression, right? And let's say your points are like this. So just in terms of linear regression, you can kind of see that the that like so so the question is, what you're asking is why bother having a b? Why not just do y equals mx and no b? Well, the problem is with y equals mx, all you can do is have something that's like this or like this, right? But well, you need something up here. I guess I see that I see that when you're working with one neuron. When I'm talking about the middle layer, it's like what matters is how much, like the B, I don't know, I guess I'm like in the middle layer, you're then forwarding on to the next layer. So couldn't you just adjust the W coming out of there rather than adjusting the B in that neuron? All right, so, so you could, that, that which, is, which is what we're doing here also, we're just adjusting that W and we're changing the, the slope of this function. But you still can't get a very good, the, the best okay, possible yeah. fit because sometimes you just need to translate it somewhere because maybe it's not actually going through the origin. So like imagine if your x variable is zero, right. then, um, then uh, but the y is actually not zero, then you need something to just offset it. So that's why with lines you also have this slope, co uh, slope coefficient, or uh, sorry, slope intercept. It's right. the same, same thing, yeah. Um, but here's the thing, and, and we'll kind of see this when we get into training. I, we won't, this won't be super important, so don't worry if this flies over your head, but um, in machine learning, there's a trick that you can do uh, because scientists find it annoying to think about Ws and Bs at the same time. Um, you can think of, uh, you can, one trick you can do is, so you see this formula? Imagine that B was just another W, and then we just had another variable x, 3, which is always 1, right? And so by having an extra variable that's always 1, then b just becomes equivalent to another weight. Um, and then so, so in theory, really, w's and b's are all the same to us. We, they're just all parameters that have to be selected. So eventually, you won't really need to make a distinction between them in you know in in terms of like from a high level when you're doing machine learning training but um but just from a you know derivation standpoint it's useful to to think about but yeah that good question okay so um so yeah actually get back to this demo oops um okay so this is our mean square error so we want to get a better answer now i will magically give you the best set of weights Right, uh, we will talk about this magic next week because it's interesting. But but imagine there's some algorithm which figures out a really good set of Ws and Bs, such that when you do this again, you get the actual correct answer, 0.58. Right? Turns out that these weights give us the right answer, and so this is the goal of training in machine learning. It's to it's to figure out what the parameters, the weights. W's and B's of this neural network should be in order to get the right answer. And maybe you have a, a large data set, maybe you have a hundred examples, and so you have a hundred pairings of X and Y, and so maybe you can't actually get a set of W's and B's which gets the right answer for all of them, but you can get a set of W's and B's that gives you the smallest um, average error. That's the mean squared error. Um, did you have another question? No? Okay. Any, anybody have a, a question? Uh, yeah? Can I ask a, a little about uh, the terms and metaphors that are used, like why neurons, why weights? 
yeah um that's uh so and i th i feel like do i have slides about this i can't remember um maybe it's already if i do then oh well, funny enough i don't actually i guess i guess uh oh no there's there are some slides later but okay i'll, I'll answer this quickly now um so the the originally this these algorithms were we we used neurons and neural uh, neural networks because they were um, as terminology because they were roughly inspired by the brain right so in the 1940s people were thinking like we can try to create algorithms which are intelligent well what are the only intelligent things we know of right now brains how do brains work roughly speaking they have a bunch of these these neurons which send signals to each other and those signals are modulated by by you know sort of electric potential and then the patterns in those signals produce different kinds of you know responses in from the subject and so it's just a metaphor it's, it's exactly what you say it's a metaphor um, it turns out that like over the last 30 40 50 years the uh, way that m machine learning research has greatly diverged from from uh, the way the brain actually works these are very very simplified versions of the brain the brains neurons and brains actually have a whole bunch of complicated things that we don't attempt to model here um, so for example like they they have delays the signals um, you know they, they, they don't actually just like happen sort of in lockstep with each other um, synapses have all sorts of weird properties and and also you don't really I mean there is some layering of neurons in the brain but it's a lot more complicated there's like connections sort of it's just chaos inside the brain but chaos is really hard to model in the computer um, it, it, if you make these simplifying assumptions you can do the multiplications very quickly so there's a bunch of simplifications so um, there is a whole other field called um, computational neuroscience which is much more about actually trying to model the brain in all of its glory uh, but machine learning is just kind of like don't care about whether we're doing the brain correctly we just want the results to be correct yeah yeah i guess i do have a question um is it true that with only one data point like this there might be multiple sets of ways that give you the correct answer yes and then with more data points it would shrink that so. um e even with more data points you're still going to have essentially like an almost inf uh, basically an infinite amount of weight combinations that I mean, maybe not infinite but like a lot um, so in machine learning um, when we're finding the best set of weights we can't um, necessarily and, and basically in practice we can't guarantee that the weights that we find are the theoretical best in fact that's the whole that's the whole central question research question of machine learning is like what is the best we can do right now the best we can do is we can get a good set of weights right um, and that, that's actually it's one of the interesting things is like all of the machine learning all of machine learning that we can do we've known about it in theory for a hundred years like we've known exactly that you can use equations to model functions in perfect with perfect integrity uh, for, for something like a hundred years but however we just didn't know how to get the right set of weights in for some arbitrary uh, data set until like a few years ago basically so that's kind of one of the interesting success stories in machine learning question no yeah what do you think is the difference between statistical learning and machine learning statistical learning theory is something that uh what is the difference between them I don't know if there really is one to be quite honest with you I think I think maybe statistical learning theory just kind of predates machine learning a little bit like before well let's see because I want to say statistical learning theory kind of goes back to like let's say the early 80s and 70s or something like that and maybe in statistical learning theory there's like um, it's a little bit less sort of computer oriented um, it's more like um, I'm, I'm slightly guessing but I <laughs> But uh, they're very related, um, like statistical learning theory and machine learning. It's rather, roughly, roughly the same. But you know, these, like, what is deep learning? You know, people now ask, okay, what's the difference between deep learning and machine learning? And it's all branding, basically. Um, so, uh, but I think they're they're roughly related. Yeah. Um, Can you 
you do that. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that next week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'll do that next week. This week it's a magic trick. Um, the way that it's done is using a. a, a um, so there's a few ways of doing it, but the way that's dominant in machine learning today is a um, an optimization algorithm called gradient descent. And we'll talk about how gradient descent works next week. And actually, like, if you want to go ahead, I'll show you where you can learn about that. Like later this week even uh, before before next week if you'd like I'll present some resources but it takes a little while to, to explain that um, okay so uh, I mentioned sigmoids are the nonlinear units that make it so that these things are not flat anymore turns out that sigmoids are not really used anymore because of a problem called the great uh, the vanishing gradient problem you can look look at look at that it's really I mean again like Maybe it's too much detail, but you can you can search that if you want. But um, sigmoids are mostly for for in in most cases are not used. In some cases, they're still used, but uh, for the most part, in like feedforward neural networks, you'll see a lot of um, different kinds of activation functions. Oh, th there's another term for it, by the way. This is called an activation function. And so now uh, now actually the preferred one that's used a lot is called ReLU, rectified linear unit. It's a really complicated name, but it, it's actually a really simple function. ReLU just means max of zero and, and whatever the output is. So if you have whatever this function is, just uh, if it's negative, make it zero. That's all that ReLU does. There's different variants of it, but basically ReLU is this. And um, even though it seems linear here, this, non, this point right here actually makes it nonlinear so that when you compose them together, the, the overall neural network can actually be a curved function, can, can have a curved shape, just because of this disjunction here. Um, yeah, it's kind of a, not curved exactly, but it can have, you know, it, it's not a plane anymore. Um, and this, so, so what's really interesting about this is that if your neural network, and, and many neural networks, like the, the like deep learning neural networks, is that all you have is multiplications, additions, and max uh, and max operations maximum of two things so all three of those operations are really really easy to understand you know addition multiplication and max right and so a neural network is just these graphs of those operations moving in some direction and but but there's so many neurons that you can get complicated behavior from them um, even though the actual math is really really easy um, so this is easy math, believe it or not. It, like if you want hard math, you can take quantum mechanics. There's some hard math here. But in machine learning, um, the math is, is actually like deceptively simple. And you'll see gradient descent is actually, um, to understand gradient descent, all you really need to understand is that this and like a tiny bit of calculus. You know. and, and how many people have taken calculus? Like three quarters of you, a while ago, sure, yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But but okay, but you remember taking it and it wasn't so bad. So if you if you can if you feel like you could take it again and then and then and then you understand these things, you can understand basically ninety percent of the math in machine learning. It's really not um, actually like too bad. Um, okay, so. Let's just see how we're doing on time. And it's 4.15, we started at 3.20, so I have maybe like, maybe another 20 or so minutes before the break, and so we're making okay time. Um, let me just see kind of like, uh, oh, um, how many slides, there's that. Get into Covnets, okay. This may run a bit long, but I'll I'll try to be I'll try to keep it relatively concise. So let's look at an example of this. Um, so one good example to use is the MNIST data set. MNIST is the hello world of machine learning. It's this data set that was collected in the I think the early 90s or something like that. It's a data set of 60,000 images of handwritten digits numbers um, that people wrote 
um, actual people. And the data set is of the digits. And also we have the, the images and we have the labels. The labels being what digit is this? So you have a text file that says this image is of a zero, this image is of a nine, this image is of a four. Um, and um, so we have the correct labels for for almost all of them. The one funny thing about MNIST is that some of the labels are actually wrong because humans label them and even humans make mistakes too. Like you might look at someone's four and it looks like a nine, something like that. So there's actually mistakes in MNIST, but roughly, roughly they're mostly accurate. And uh, there's 60,000 images. They're, they have 28 by 28 pixels in their grayscale. So this is an image, this is a data set that you can get online in a million places, it's very well known. And so let's look, in, let's look at how we would use machine learning to create an algorithm which tells you that this image is of a nine, right? So this is 28 by 28 grid. There's seven, so that's 784 pixels. And what it looks like to a machine is a bunch of value, a bunch of numbers between zero and 255, right? So this is what this looks like. Um, so okay, so how would we, how would we go about trying to create an, uh, uh, an algorithm which looks at these numbers and tells us that this is a nine, given that we have this data set? So what you can do is you can create a neural network which whose input layer is is the pixels themselves right so you have a 784 neuron input layer which takes the pixels right and then it, and then so imagine for example that we made a one layer neural network this is uh that you count layers with connections so this is a one layer neural network um so we go directly from the input layer of pixels to the output layer of the digits. And so what we want is we want the, the W's here, and the B's, to be such that when we take these values from this image of a six and we input them here and we do all these multiplications and additions, that what we want is the, the neuron which stands for a six to have the highest value and for the other neurons to have the, a low value, right? That's the goal. And so, um, and, and, then, and then our algorithm goes, okay, do a forward pass, look at the values and whichever one has the highest, predict that digit. So, um, so like we, for each neuron, you can actually, you can actually, you know, you can think of it, each of these as mini neural networks if you want, you know, that's, that's actually a nice, I think it's kind of a nice way of looking at it. They unpack this way, right? This W1, W2, all the way to W784. And one thing you can do that um, is useful is you can try to imagine, so as you see there's one weight for every pixel for the image, just one weight for every pixel. And so, you know, you have this whole row of them, but another way to think about it is because the image is square, you can also imagine, because there's one weight for every pixel, you can imagine the weights along that grid as well. You can imagine them as square, right? So this, what's happening here for the, this first class here is that you get all of these X's, the pixels, being multiplied point for point by all of these W's and then added together. It's a dot product. This is called a dot product. And so you can imagine the W's in this way. Does that kind of make sense? Um, and the reason why I'm showing you this is because um, we're going to take a look at what these weights look like. You can actually visualize the weights and that's actually quite informative if you do. Um, so now imagine we imagine you do this for all of the all, for all of these 10 classes and then you visualize the weights where um, you know dark is is low and then um, and then brightness is brightness is basically the value of the weight. So there's 784 weights, 28 by 28, for each of these output neurons. And in the beginning, we set all of the Ws to be random because we don't know any better. So just set them all to be random. And then we train the network. And training the network means that we begin to input examples, give it more and more and more examples. And then, 
And then, uh, okay, so one, one thing I didn't mention is, is that this process of training the neural network is iterative. Iterative in the sense that you show it some examples and improve the weights. And then you show it some more examples and then you improve the weights. And you show it some more examples and improve the weights and you do this over and over and over and over and over until it stops improving. This is how training works. And we'll talk about the actual algorithm next week, but uh, just know that it's iterative. That basically you kind of like, it's like correcting it little by little by little by little until you get the until you get acceptable acceptably good results and so if you visualize this process you'll see and visualize the weights as you do it you'll see something interesting that if you're visualizing the weights the weights associated with the zero neuron um, looks kind of like a weird sort of average looking zero and the weights associated with the one you know you see kind of a one here you see roughly two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Um, so, uh, yeah. Do you have a question? Um, how do we get accuracy from mean squared errors? Ah, uh, uh, oh, it's, yeah. Well, it's just, it's, just, it's just a separate statistic. You would use mean squared error to to actually train uh, accuracy. I'm just doing like um, literally like how which percentage of of the uh, of the images are labeled correctly yeah but you but yeah technically you evaluate it based on error, error, in some error function you wouldn't use accuracy because it's not differentiable but we'll get into that next week um, yeah are the images on the right hand side also recreating every so the images on the right hand side are actually visualizations of the weights not the pixels so they're so they're the w's not the x's um, so th think about why this would make sense. Like think think of it this way: this neuron right here is responsible for for having a high value. What what? Okay, what this neuron wants, let's say, is that it wants to have a high value when you receive images of zeros, and to have a low value when you receive images of everything else. So the way that it can best do that is to have weights, high weights, for all of the pixels which tend to be on for zeros and tend to be off for the other digits. Um, and you, it wants to have low weights for pixels that tend to be off in zeros and, and pixels that tend to be on in the other numbers, um, which is why it's really dark here, right? Because images of zeros tend to have pixels over here it's a point for point multiplication. So you get big numbers times big numbers plus small numbers times small numbers. And so you get, that's basically why you have a pattern like this. And same for all the others, right? Um, so now the reason why I show you this is, is, um, is that it's kind of a hint of what's going on here. The neural networks are learning, these are features, right? And the features here are because it's a one layer neural network, the, whole, the feature is the whole image category. Like the feature is, is each digit, right? In neural networks that have multiple layers, you'll see that the features have, um, can, be, can sort of evolve at multiple stages. And you'll see that in a few slides. But here the features are the digits themselves. And so you can kind of, it's, it's a hint of things, you know? So like, remember Deep Dream, um, we'll show Deep Dream in a few weeks, but you know, Deep Dream sort of exploits this property. <laughs> to um, get sort of archetypes of things almost like almost like this um, so yeah and this is just a summary of that now imagine if we added another layer here so that instead of one layer we have two layers and you know the middle layer might have some arbitrary number of neurons maybe 10 15 whatever um, then um, then we can still visualize these um, we can still visualize the the weights in the um, like we can still visualize these weights right here um, it becomes harder to visualize all the weights because now you don't they're not necessarily aligned with the original pixels um, but um, but what happens is that now in this case you give the neural network a chance to form a more compositional model right so for example if you do this so like okay one problem with this notice by the way it has a very low accuracy the accuracy only reaches like 
which is terrible for image recognition, uh, for digit recognition. Like the, our best results are like 99.99, so which is a lot less error. So the reason why this is so low is because it's really hard to learn this all in one layer without getting confusion between you know threes and twos, let's say. Um, what is there a question? Ah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so you can understand. We, we mentioned why these areas are, are bright and these areas are dark. The surrounding area is kind of turns out to be random. And the reason is because there's no point in making it dark because it's off for all of the digits. Right. So there's no signal there. There's not that much information there because basically there's no pixels around here. They, they tend to be off everywhere. And so that's roughly the answer. Yeah. So is the reason for <coughs> applying the second layer to get more accuracy? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you'll get more accuracy because now, now you can do something like this. So like, OK, uh, maybe uh, you might get some confusion between, let's say, ones and sevens or threes and twos, you know, or nines and fours, right? Uh, because they overlap a lot. So one thing you can do is you can try to make a more sort of detailed model that takes sort of sub features, you know? So like, for example, you might, uh, in now if you have two layers, the first layer, instead of learning the entire digit categories, it might learn sort of sub features, like a loop, a loop, you know, at the top, a straight, a vertical, a diagonal line, you know, um, uh, or maybe a curved side, a curve around the left, something like that, right? And then combine those together to form each of the digits. So, for example, like an eight, or, or let's say a nine, is a is a loop at the top plus a line at the bottom, something something like that, right? It, it's, it ends up being a little bit more complex than that, but that's that's like roughly roughly something something what's actually going on. You can actually see that here. So if we use this, this is an actual visualization. You'll see that the weights are now they don't look like the digits, right? They look like these sort of more abstract things, but you can actually combine these at different weights. You know, sort of weight these uh, weight these. We can call them filters. You might think of them as a filter. And it is a filter because it's a dot product, so you get like, it's a way of sort of like, well, I don't want to get too, too mathy, but, but you can think of them as a filter in some sense. And then you can weight the filters to get your different digits. So like, a, you know, I mean, okay, I'll assign some reading that will explain this graph in a little more detail if you're interested. It's not strictly necessary, but the idea now is that you can take these sort of sub filters and combine them roughly, and that's, and that's kind of what's going on. And if you do that, you'll get, you should get more accuracy. Now, now then you might ask like, well then, why don't I just add a hundred layers? Like if I just add more and more layers, will you get more and more accuracy? Um, the funny thing is like, apparently yes, like to, to, to some degree. There's one, one trend in deep learning over the last few years is that if you make the network bigger, it'll just get better. Um, and so we just make them as big as possible. There is diminishing returns though. Like maybe for 10% of the size, you'll get 99% of the accuracy. And then you can spend, you can make the network 10 times bigger to get one more extra point. At some point it really is, it stops, you know, sort of learning. Uh, it doesn't get worse though, it tends not to get worse, at least not anymore. Um, now that we have a bunch of tricks for avoiding that. Okay, so now imagine we have a more complicated data set. I'm just gonna, let's see here, we started at six, 20, this class is two hours and 55 minutes, so each roughly one and a half hours. So we, we go into like, I'm gonna try to do this in the next 10 minutes. I'm, I'll probably fail, but uh, we'll leave some for, after the, for the, after the break. So imagine we have a more complicated data set. Uh, this is a data set called CIFAR 10. It's a, another 10 category data set consisting of 10 objects. And those objects are, let's see if I remember this, cats, dogs, frogs, cars, ships, airplanes. Um, what is it? I said frogs, right? Um, what the hell is in it? Uh, 
A what? An ostrich. There's, this is not an ostrich. Um, it's like, uh, I have it written down somewhere. Where the hell? Okay, deer, deer, frog, horse, ship, truck. Has trucks and uh, planes and birds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, okay, so the reason why we show this is that this data set, if you do the same approach as this, like if you try to do this for CIFAR 10, then, okay, here you see zeros, ones, twos, it's very visible, right? And you get decent accuracy, 88%. I mean, it's not that good, but okay, it's 88%. I mean, random guesses would be 10%, right? So 88% is, is compared to that, pretty good. But if you did it for CIFAR 10, your accuracy would not be 88%, it would be something like 25%, which is not that much better than random guesses, which is 10%. I mean, still better, but not that much. And the reason is because now these categories of images are just more complicated than digits. Um, why are they more complicated? So for one thing, their color. So now that's three times as much information just, just by that virtue. Um, but also because the objects that they have are sort of like a little bit more diverse with, within each class. So for example, like, you know, cats. These are just cats. Look at how many different kinds of cats there are. Um, I mean, cats can be curled up or outstretched. They can be in different orientations. They can be different positions. They can be have different fur patterns, different colors. The images of the cats can be cluttered with other objects. Um, then some of them, I mean, just look at this. I mean, it's an abomination. Like, I mean, so um, so this obviously like this becomes very difficult to 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 in capture because there's too much diversity. And so doing an average of cats, you'll just get this. That's the average cat, right? Um, and, and okay, like the average ship is really blue. Okay, that makes sense, right? Um, but okay, but the average ship is really blue and the average plane is really blue too, right? So you'll get a lot of plane ship confusion because basically these filters are almost exactly the same. Um, I like this horse filter though. It looks kind of like a, like a two-headed horse, you know? Um, so, so one layer in your lyric is just going to have a really bad accuracy. Um, now, another problem, because, because of this diversity, it turns out that we really, we really, really need to make our neural networks a little bit more complicated. And uh, so, so now I'm going to complicate the feedforward neural network diagram even more. <laughs> and we're going to introduce what are called convolutional neural networks. And the convolutional neural network just for the sake of terminology, convolutional neural network, all that means is it's a, it's a neural network that has at least one convolutional uh, layer somewhere. And I'll show you what a convolutional layer is. Uh, but before I do that, I will kind of explain the, the sort of justification or, or maybe like the, the uh, from an abstract level, the approach to like w how we came up with convolutional layers, right? So imagine that you're trying to learn what cars look like, right? Um, one way of, um, of or, or let, let's use cats actually because we were using cats before. One way of doing this is right, is the approach that we used, you know, where you have this filter that looks for the average cat, right? Um, but that's not very good because there's too many kinds of cats. And so the average cat is just mush. But um, in your mind, the way that you know how to look for cats is that you look for certain components that are floating around that put together equal a cat, right? So cats are these objects, which it's a really funny way of thinking of cats. It's like an object. A cat is an object which has, you know, eyes, whiskers, fur, tail, ears, right? Things like that, right? And so maybe a better approach to finding cats would be to look for the subcomponents of cats and if you have all or most of them um, then you can be sure that you probably have a cat right um, and that's much better than doing this average cat approach because the more you zoom in on the actual subcomponents 
the less diverse they become, right? So there's a lot of diversity of cats, but there's not as much diversity of cat ears or cat eyes. You know, all eyes look roughly the same. I mean, okay, you know, eyes can look different, but you know, they're not as different as cats can look, right? And so you look for each of those objects and then you put them together, right? And the nice thing about this is that if you have a part of your brain that's good at finding ears, then, um, then, then you can apply that not just to finding, not just to detecting cats, but also to detecting dogs, because dogs also have ears. And so now you have this way of taking small things and kind of, you know, um, reusing them, right, in some sense, right? Um, and uh, that's much more efficient, and it's also just much more accurate. And so that's the basic idea behind convolutional neural networks. Let's find the small things and put them together. Um, that's the that's the idea, right? And we've known about convolutional neural networks also for a really long time, since the 80s, you could say, or maybe even the 60s, I think, depending on who you ask. It's controversial, actually. But um, convolutional neural networks didn't work very well until the late 90s. And even then, they only worked at, in a limited capacity. Um, the first person to really make them work really well is this guy named Jan LeCun, who was, who was a professor uh, right here at NYU. Um, I think at Courant. I want to say at the Courant, at the um, Courant School. And now, Jan LeCun, um, how many of you have heard of the name Jan LeCun? Okay, a few of you. Jan LeCun is now the uh, director of AI at Facebook. Basically one of the most important um, uh, Facebook AI research. Right? So he's not really working on Facebook per se, but working in Facebook research. And one of the most important computer scientists in the world just won a Turing Award last year, which is like the Nobel Prize of computer science. So, um, so yeah, like came up with, he didn't come up with convolutional neural networks, uh, but he made them work properly, let's say. And um, in the late 90s, in fact, the, 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 the uh, system that he and his collaborators made while they were at Bell Labs, I think, um, was uh, reading something like 20%. It was being used to read checks. So um, in the late 90s, we had machines reading something like 20% of all of the checks in being um, signed in the US. Um, now there's kind of, um, what's interesting about that is that now basically all of them are done that way, but in the late 90s, which, which I think everyone here remembers roughly, right? Um, and, you know, back then, like, we basically, like, people were doing that. That's it. Like, back then, like, every check was being read by people. So that's one thing that has, like, very quickly been eliminated, roughly, as a task that people have to do. Um, and, um, yeah, as, as late as the, as, the, as the late 90s. And um, so now think about what the demands of that task are. It has to be really accurate, right? Like if, it, okay, our, the first system we showed had an 88% accuracy on digits. So if you have an 88% accuracy on digits, then 12% of all the checks that you read are gonna, are gonna, be, are gonna have the wrong value in them. So that's, that's obviously gonna make a whole lot of people very upset, you know, if you're doing this for reading checks. It will also make a whole lot of people really happy, actually. Um, but, you know, roughly half of them will be very upset. So the point is it'll cause the bank a lot of headaches. So like this system, I think they had something like a 99.8% accuracy back then, or maybe it was 99.9 even nine or whatever. Um, makes mistakes, but okay, uh, a, an acceptable amount of mistakes that even humans make that you can actually rectify through some process. So that was the big accomplishment of the late 90s, and then that was that be, that was one of the big, um, that's sort of one of the big success stories of deep learning, which then a couple of years later created the deep learning movement, and then eventually led to you know deep learning sort of ascendancy. Um, when I got into machine learning, deep learning was like a crazy fringe conspiracy theory, basically. <laughs> And so people said neural networks didn't work. I got into machine learning a good 10 years after this. Um, so, uh, so yeah, in 2008, most machine learning scientists believed that neural networks could, they were like, yeah, it can do digits, but it's not gonna do anything more complicated than that. So um, 
but then it turns out that that you know maybe they were wrong. Um, this was um, so. Um, there's kind of interesting, like just for fun, the sake of um, you know, like showing you some interesting information. Like there's some precursors to to how convolutional neural networks were come up with. Um, back in the early '60s, there was pioneering work by these two um, neuroscientists, Hubble and Weasel, who I think they I think they won the Nobel Prize for this. Maybe I might be wrong about that. That, that could be wrong. But they basically figured out that brains, at least in mammals, uh, the visual cortices of brains, have something kind of like what convolutional neural networks do. Uh, they, they kind of have something like that. Um, so they, what they did was they attached electrodes into cat's brains. Um, poor kitty. Sorry. Um, but um, then they made the cat look, watch TV. Um, and the TV would have like some sort of a a pattern like a line that would kind of rotate right and then they would notice that as that line was rotating different parts of the cat's brain would light up um, and what it what they found was that basically the neurons that were connected most closely to the retinas of the cats the retinas received the signal of the TV is that those those um, neurons were basically detecting like almost like the angle of the line like they would detect an edge, which would be may maybe like one part of the brain would, would light up if it sees a vertical edge, one part of the brain would light up if it sees a horizontal edge or something like that. And then those neurons would connect to neurons farther into the brain, which would combine those signals and uh, it would uh, combine those signals to be able to light up when it received a slightly more complicated pattern. So like maybe if you receive two lines, like a corner, right? then you might have one neuron light up for one of the edges and then another neuron light up for another of the edges and I'm, I'm really simplifying this obviously like I'm not a neuroscientist but this is something something like this um, it would light up when it received the horizontal edge and one would light up when it received the vertical edge and then somewhere in uh, a few layers you would have one neuron which is taking those signals and combining them and it would be like oh when I when I get both of these I have a corner so, and then there would be another set of neurons later on, which would light up when you receive an even more complicated thing. So instead of a corner, it would be like lighting up when you receive like a set of lines in some lattice, you know, kind of. Um, and then farther, it would, it would light up for even entire objects, right? And then farther, even more complicated objects and so on. And so there's this kind of like composition of small things being combined into medium things, into big things, into complicated things, and so on. Um, and that's roughly how uh, visual cortices work in mammals. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah? So uh, I think this relates to what you were just saying, but when we're talking about the, the neural networks that are you know, fabricated by humans that have a similar structure, um, you're talking about how different neurons recognize different like sub features basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, are those sub features designated manually by the programmers, or is it something about the algorithm that almost that like automatically divides it out? Yeah. Um, so the basically the algorithm, right? It it discovers them, and it discovers them magically, as we said this week. But okay. next week we'll discover. We'll talk about how. But basically. Um, the, the, the way I can summarize it right now is that it, it just tries to find whatever features work best for the task you're trying to train it to. And if you do that, it tends to find features that, that actually correspond, like align closely with how we do it, um, roughly. But, um, but, the, the, but, you know, but if you do it twice, you might get different features every time. Um, um, so yeah, I think I think maybe like the first. This is considered maybe the first convolutional network in 1980. Um, this, this uh, I think I want to say, yeah, I guess computer scientists in Japan came up with um, a, something something kind of like a convolutional neural network. However, he um, the way that they they had it was that it was all the weights were set manually basically because at that time we didn't know how to train them. We didn't have. Uh, we didn't have what's, what's well, we didn't have what's called backpropagation, and the reason why we didn't have backpropagation backpropagation is an algorithm for solving gradient descent. We've known gradient descent for like a hundred years, uh, but the thing is that gradient descent um, 
is uh, if you do it in the sort of naive way, then solving gradient descent, it takes too long for um, if you have a very high number of, of you know, values that your parameters that you're trying to optimize. And backpropagation is this technique for solving gradient descent very, very efficiently. And, you know, we'll talk about that next week, kind of. Some of this stuff is like well beyond the scope of really what you need to know for this course because we're really focused on applications. But I like to include it because it's interesting. It'll and it's you know it's worth knowing some of the science and the math. Um, okay, so how do these convolutional filters work? So let's say we're looking. Oops. So let's say we're. Oh, that's I just had an image. Oh, because I have this demo right. Um, well, okay, because we're running at, let's see, it's 4.50, we have until 6.15, right? So let me just, let me just, for planning, let me get to the, to the convolutional network demo. And then, okay, that's not so bad. Like, we're, we've made decent time. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go up until, I'm going to go through the next four slides, and then we'll, and then we'll take a break. So basically, a convolutional filter, I'm going to skip the demo, but, but basically the way it works is that, now you have these imagine you have a filter that's looking for a small object and the filter gets slid across every part of the image and then you see how much of that pattern is in the image at every point so let's say the pattern that you're looking for is this right here right so you just take a dot product of this with every 5 by 5 cell of this image and then basically wherever the pattern, where, wherever it resembles, wherever the you know, five by five cells resembles this, you get a, a bright value here. Uh, this will actually, it will make sense if I actually show this um, really quickly. Oh, the demo figures, um, where was it again? Oh, I have totally, convolution demo. Demos convolution. Ah. So like imagine, let's look at this, let's look at it, this filter. So this filter, see it's kind of bright in the, in the bottom left and dark in the top right, roughly. So wherever, wherever we are in the image where it's kind of bright in the bottom left and dark in the top right, you'll get a bright value. You see the little red dot there? It's kind of bright there because the pattern is sympathetic to the filter um, or to the pixels that are sympathetic to the filter. And in, in here, it's the opposite. So you get small values times big values plus big values times small values. So you get a dark value, right? So that's kind of what they are. They're like pattern matchers. And the pattern matchers get slid across the entire image and you have maybe multiple filters in one layer. So you'll get these different, these different, uh, the activation maps, they're called activation maps. So you can see that like, oh, this is cut off. <laughs> I got it. Huh, I gotta fix that, but okay. Um, actually, I bet, yeah, there we go, okay. Little bugs, bugs here, bugs there. <laughs> You see that you get these activation maps, right? And they all, you know, they all look kind of different. And they're all looking for different features. And so this is a convolutional layer. And actually, like, it, it seems like it's completely different from what we saw before, but it's really not. Like, you can actually, um, like, uh, you can think of this as uh, a feed forward layer, which is not fully connected. There's all these skipped connections. I mean, we don't have to. We don't have to belabor that point, but 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 basically, it's just another kind of layer, right? Which which is good for this. Then there's another kind of layer called pooling layers, which are really easy to understand. Pooling layers are um, they're actually slowly becoming obsolete. So in a few years, maybe we won't have them at all. But pooling layers are a cheap way of reducing the amount of information. Um, and the most common kind of pooling, what it does is it takes the images and downsamples them. It takes the activation maps and downsamples them. So instead of you know four by four, you'll get two by two, and it'll do it by taking groups of four pixels and taking the maximum value of them. 
Uh, you, there's also average pooling, which takes the average of them. Max takes the max of them. Um, max is usually used, you know, experimentally found that max is better. Um, go figure. But basically, yeah, you take this group of one, one, five, six, to so the maximum of six, two, four, seven, eight, maximum is eight, and so on. And this kind of, because we're trying to take all of this voluminous information, you know, all of the pixels, and reduce it down to 10 values. Signal of, you know, how much it is a zero, signal of how much it is a one. So we have to take the numbers and make them smaller and smaller and less and less. Smaller but higher level. And so pooling layers are a cheap way of doing that because there's no parameters to train. It's just, a, you know, it's just that this basically, uh, this cheap way of doing it. Because there's no parameters to train, it's not the, it's not the best way, of, not the smartest way of doing it, I suppose, which is why maybe they're slightly going out of style, but for whatever reason, it kind of works okay. Um, and so in a lot of image classification networks, it's, it's used. So let me show you a demo, and then that'll actually just about bring us to the end of the half here. So let me show you this demo. This is part of what you downloaded, by the way, so you'll, you'll have this if you want. Um, Can I ask something? Yeah. Where do we save that folder? In our like, file structure in Open Framework? You don't have to put it there because these are just built applications. So if you downloaded the release, you can just double click on the application. Although uh, you won't be able to do it just now because we have to do something first, but okay. I'll, we'll do that in the, after the break. So we can put it wherever we want. Basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but you have to make sure that, like, move the whole folder because there's this data folder that it needs access to. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so, okay, so, like, here's, this is a trained convolutional neural network, uh, which was the best one in the world in 2014. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so, basically, it takes this webcam image, and in the first layer, this is the first convolutional layer, it has all of these filters. These are the the whiskers, the eyes, the ears, and so on, these are the filters. Now they don't look like whiskers or ears or whatever because they're just looking for small patterns. Like basically they're looking for edges, you know, basically edges more or less, like really small patterns or maybe clumps of pink or clumps of green or whatever. And there's 96 filters and so each filter gets slid across the, Im the input image and then you get these activation maps from it, right? So this is this this right here is the amount of this filter at every spatial point in the image, right? And there's a whole bunch of them, right? And you can see that some of them like like horizontal ed edges, some of them like vertical edges, some of them like some clumps of of some particular color. You know, it's it's sort of hard to tell, but more or less you can see they're all slightly different. And so you have all these activation maps. And then, it, uh, there's another kind of layer here, which is a normalization layer, it just brightens everything. And then also, here's a pooling layer, which will take everything and downsample it. So now it goes from being a little coarser. So now there's half, uh, one quarter as many pixels. So you have these. And then, here's where things get weird. We do another convolution. And so you, now you get another com set of convolutional layers. Now, how, what is, how does this work exactly? So the idea is that here, after the pooling layer, you have 90, uh, 96 of these. And so what you can do with all of these, these channels is you can stack them together and you have a new kind of image, right? And I put image in, square, in scare quotes because, because when you think of an image, you think red, green, blue. You have three channels in this image. And each of the pixels represent how much red there is, how much green there is, and how much blue there is, right? This is really sort of the same th idea. You can take all of these and now you have 96 channels instead of three. And these channels don't represent how much red, how much green, how much blue there is, but they represent how much of this entire filter is, is at each of these locations. But really, from a data structure level, it's the same thing. It's this um, so now, now there's, a, I think, 120, uh, there's, let's see, 225, 112. So these are 112 by 112, each of these. So if you stack them together, you have 112 by 112 by 96. You have this big volume of, of pixels, right? 
they're not pixels in the, in the conventional sense because it's not just representing a color, but it's a pixel in the sense that it represents the intensity of some, some kind of a thing that we're looking for. So you have this new thing and you can get a new set of convolutional filters which are no longer, which are no longer color. They're no, no longer like three channel themselves, but they have 96 channels. They have to have the same depth as, the, as these. And so basically you do another set of convolutions and you get new activation maps. And you can see, you can still see me kind of in there, but now the patterns have become kind of more complicated because it seems like, you know, now, now it, it, before in the first fill in layer, they were sort of like edges. But now they might be slightly more complicated. Maybe they're, they're corners, or maybe they're crosses, or maybe they're, you know, like two clumps of color next to each other. They could be a, a bunch of things. They're still hard to interpret, but the point is they're all different patterns. And they're slightly more complicated patterns than the previous ones. So now we do the same thing. Normalization, pooling. Now they go from 112 by 112 to uh, 56 by 56. And now there's actually more of them, I think. I think there's now like 200. Uh, two, 255 of them. Uh, by the way, you might ask, like, why the, how are the numbers chosen? Basically, basically people just guess. <laughs> they more, I mean, now, okay, that's how they used to do it. They just guess and then pick whatever works the best and just go figure. Now there's actually procedures for, um, you, if you look into AutoML, something Google came up with, which is like a, a way of sort of determining architectures, um, you know, the, the arc architecture means like decisions like how many filters, how many neurons, how many channels, you know, what's the skip, connections, whatever. All of that stuff can actually be automated as well. But, but yeah, that's how the number, for, for all intents and purposes, the numbers are arbitrary. Another convolution, another convolution, another convolution. So now you have patterns that are beginning to become very abstract. And um, now what are these, right? It's like, it's really hard to interpret them, right? Some of them are very hard to interpret, but some of them are not that hard to interpret. So for example, my favorite is, I always show 156, mm -hmm. CON4 156. You notice this one? Yeah. It's a, it, yeah, it seems to be lighting up for faces, right? And I know that it's faces and not skin, right? Because if I put my hand here, my hand is the same color as my face, but it's not really finding it. I can kind of even cover my face. Here's, I'll even do a trick. I'll like put, let's see if I can find another face here. I'll try to find the picture of me. Okay, I'll, here's a picture of my cousin. I get, oh no, it's a video. Let's see. Uh, ah, there we go. Okay. Look at that. <laughs> so yeah, it's roughly lighting up for faces. So um, that's pretty cool. We didn't even we didn't tell it to look for faces. Yeah. So I I didn't put it there. I downloaded it. These are this is a trained neural network. Um, now how they got them is through the process of training, and and we're going to talk about it next week. Yeah. So there's no easy way to visualize them b precisely because they have 96 channels. Mm -hmm. you, you, yeah, yeah, and actually here now they have 255 even. Um, so you can't like, you know, like we don't have color perception that combines 200 fundamental kinds of colors. So the only way to look at them would be to look at all of the filters maybe one by one. But, but even then it wouldn't make that much sense because those filters are based from our composites of previous layers. So they lose the sort of correspondence to the original image. So at that point, it's sort of not even worth looking at them anymore. Yeah. And what is the show? Sorry? When you click view filters. Right? It's actually, the, when you click view filters, just looking at the first ones. Oh, no. Yeah. Because those are pretty, those are straightforward because, because they operate on the original image, on the original color image. OK, so then we do another pooling layer. And then finally, we take all of these. I don't know why it flickers. It's a bug. But anyway, we take all of these, and then they get flattened. Flattened means that we, we take them out of their sort of these square map configuration, just, just stretch them out into one big row, 
and then we add another we add a fully con sorry a fully connected layer and then you get something that looks like this now it looks like a rectangle but but that's just because there's there's 4096 of them and I I turned them into a rectangle so that you could see them all but really there's no spatial correspondence anymore we got rid of space now what what are these these are each of these are looking for some complex feature and it's the amount of that feature so for example this the it's glitchy I don't know why um, but like okay the, the filters that are bright I sorry, the pixels that are bright represent it means that in this image whatever that thing is looking for there's a lot of it and if they're dark there's not that much of it and you'll see that as I move around in the image the pattern stays roughly the same I mean it's you know it's it's modulating a little bit but for the most part it stays the same um, and that shows how robust it is to changes in you know scale you know translation maybe maybe lighting conditions it's re relatively indifferent to it and actually there's two fully connected layers and then finally at the end there's a classification layer which is predicting what we have here so website I'm a website I mean, I mean it makes sense like this is a website window shade um, so like okay if I put my phone in front of it it should be pretty good um, seat belt well iPod iPod yeah no, it, um, hold on a second iPod see this never is so stupid it can't tell apart Android and iPod Handheld computer, modem. Um, hold on a second. Let me. Um, let me see. Ah, can I grab something? Hold on a second. I grabbed it. So it 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 had a feature for face that doesn't it would never change. It. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, oh, it's not. There's no class for face. It's really, it's really bad today. I feel like the lighting and it's it's a little better than this. You see, the confidences are very low. To some degree, it does. Okay, so it doesn't seem that good. Like, but I think maybe the feedback is screwing up. But anyway, the point is, like, it does. The, the the thing is, like, for our purposes, the classification isn't actually that important. Wig. Wig. Yeah. Yeah. Now the, now, the thing is, with bow tie, it makes sense because a lot of images of bow ties have faces on top of them, right? So it's kind of confusing, sort of sampling bias, um, as we call it. Um, you know, pictures of oboes, I think, have people faces playing them, right? So that's kind of why, why you might see that. Anyway, um, the, for our purposes, this actually doesn't matter too much. What matters is actually this. It's a robust sort of... Um, feature vector, which, which we're going to make use of um, after the break, actually. So let me quickly just like, so first of all, um, that's Cognet Viewer. That's in the ML for AOFX cl collection. You, you have that, and I'll show you how to use it in a little bit. Um, I want to maybe, yeah, we, we've already shown this. AlexNet. Um, so yeah, let me mention a few more things before the break. So first of all, image classification was really is a really hard problem. And actually, in the ImageNet, uh, competition, which was the sort of standard competition for computer vision algorithms to compete over image classification. We had something like in 2010, before deep learning became really popular, the uh, top five error in this image net competition was close to 30%. So you take, let's say, a million images, um, and then you have a thousand categories, and then you try to predict, you make five guesses for each image. 
almost 30% of them, for even the best algorithms, 30% of them would not get the right category within the top five guesses, right? Which is a lot. Um, and then in 2012, there was something like a 12% drop in one year because that's when AlexNet was published. AlexNet refers to a network by Jeffrey Hinton, Alex Trzewski, and Ilya Sutskiver. Um, Jeff Jeffrey Hinton is now like basically considered one of the you know sort of pioneers of deep learning. Also won the Turing Award, just retired recently. And um, Ilya Sutskiver is the head of OpenAI. Um, I'm not sure what Alex Trzewski is doing right now. Maybe he's maybe he's at Google. Almost everyone's either at Google or DeepMind or at Facebook AI. You know, IBM, Intel, Baidu. Um, so yeah, AlexNet kind of like got to 16% and then it just plummeted. So in 2000, I think now, yeah, in 2017, before the image, before the competition was retired, the top five error had gone down to 2.25%, which is really, really low. And actually like, yeah, there's a blog post about this by Andre Karpathy, where he tried to, um, where he tried to compete with these class, you know, these networks as a human. And um, even humans have an error rate of, you know, from a thousand categories, of humans will have an error rate of at least four or five percent themselves. Because, um, I mean, like, one hundred of the categories are different breeds of dogs. So, <laughs> like, can you tell apart all the different dog breeds? Like, you're gonna make some mistakes. So it's kind of um, it's pretty interesting. We're out, we're better than humans at this at this point. Um, Okay, so actually, like, I'll stop here and let's take a uh, let's take five, and then when we come back, I'm gonna I have a few more slides, and then we're gonna get into runway and ML five and all that other stuff. Yeah, so take a break. Um, I, I just thinking out loud, like I am actually. So the the screen recording is so huge that if I start recording the second one it will um, overrun the amount of space I have here and it will, will stop. However, I figured out that I'll just render the movie, which I'm doing right now, delete the screen flow, and then I'll have space for the second half. However, um, it'll still take another 10 minutes and I don't want to wait that long. So what I'm doing is I'm actually recording the second one and rendering this at the same time, which actually seems to be okay. And then, um, and so I just need to make sure that I don't forget to delete this while we're going already. Um, so, which should be okay, I think. So someone remind me in seven minutes to look back at this. It's I'm gonna set an alarm actually. Oh, that's perfect, because I don't wanna mess this up. All right, so timer, let's say in eight minutes. Um, hang on a second. Eight minutes. Okay, so I set an alarm. So then I this should be done by then, and then we can. Okay, so let's get back to this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the slides. There's just a couple more slides that I want to talk about, and then we'll get into the tutorials. Okay. Um, now uh, and then to the the new the upcoming slides are really about the tutorials more or less. So uh, we're going to be in the next couple of weeks, more or less, going to be playing a lot with sort of interactive machine learning, which are, you know, basically neural networks that, that do stuff in the browser, right? Or, sorry, do stuff in the browser, but not necessarily in the browser, but basically just work interactively, work quickly. And we'll show a few different frameworks. And the thing is that all of them, a lot of the applications we'll show appear to be very different from each other. But really, they're only different from each other. From a machine learning standpoint, they're different from each other superficially. They're actually, um, they're actually doing roughly the same thing. And it's something called transfer learning. And I'm going to describe a little bit about what transfer learning actually is. And then we'll show the actual examples. So transfer learning like roughly means taking one machine learning algorithm, which has been trained for some purpose, and then kind of modifying it or adjusting it slightly to another application. And um, it turns out that this works really well. And the reason why it works really well is because we have these industrial strength machine learning data sets, 
with uh, machine learning models, which are really, really good for something which, which, is un which we don't really care that much about. So for example, ImageNet, you know, how much do you really want a neural network that tells you this is a bow tie, this is a toothbrush or whatever. Um, what you want are, is, a machine, is a neural network to tell you the classes that you in particular care about. So, um, so, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, the principal thing that we're after, but um, we don't really, um, we, need a, we need a way of kind of, well, the idea of transfer learning is that you can actually leverage these really, really good neural networks to retrain them on the neural networks that you kind of care about. Man, this is really heating up. Okay. <laughs> Hope there's going to be, like in the first part of the, this lecture, there will probably be a lot of like shh in the recording. I need a microphone. But, um, but yeah. Okay, anyway. So I'll let it air out a little bit. Um, so where was I? Yeah. Um, so okay, so like how would that work exactly? So imagine you take this image net. Um, yeah, even better is right there. Um, imagine that you take something like a large neural network which is really really well trained and then use it the its output as the feature vector that's the input to a smaller neural network which has the classes that you care about so the reason why this works really well is that machine learning is always harder when the data that you have is sort of low quality you know what i mean like like if you have a data set that or sorry if you have a input which is just raw pixels it's really, really bad information, right? But if, if your raw input told you about whiskers and ears and eyes and, and cats and, not cats, whiskers, eyes and ears and stuff, then probably you don't need to have such a huge deep neural network um, in order to make use of that information and tell you there's a cat or a dog because the information you're, you're receiving is already so high level that you can retain a sort of small neural network trained on less data. And so the idea of transfer learning is a lot of image recognition problems really are kind of looking at almost the same features for most of the first few layers. And then only later, later they begin to change. So the idea is you have this neural network that we saw before. And what we'll, we're going to do is we're going to chop off the last layer, which has the image in the classifications, you know, the thousand categories that we don't care about, and replace it with a new set of categories that we do care about. And, um, and, and then retrain only that last layer on the categories that we care about. And it turns out that if you do this, you don't need that many examples. You can actually train things really, really quickly um, and do a pretty good job. And so the basis of most of our image classification um, is going to be using this, this technique. And I'm going to show you how to do it in a few different places. Um, so yeah, the, and the, the, this idea of chopping off the last layer and then taking the second to last layer as your input vector, it, we, can, we can think of this as feature extraction. So we're using this network that we just looked at, or maybe one like it, um, as a feature extractor. It's going to be, instead of doing a classification, it's just going to be giving us a feature vector, which describes that image statistically, and then we can use that as the input vector to a smaller neural network. Um, so does that roughly make sense? Um, okay, so what we're going to do, I'm going to show you a few different things, and this, this kind of introduces the different different frameworks that we're using, and actually maybe this makes sense in the, oh, I thought I had, um, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll see in a second. I'll show you some examples. Um, so, um, okay, we'll, we're going to look at ML5, ML4A demo, also the thing that you're looking at is actually Wekinator and ML4A effects. And these are all different things that we're gonna we're gonna show different examples. Um, so um, this fellow right here is named Andreas Rafska. He's a common collaborator of mine and and co co wrote a lot of ML Frey with me. Just in case you were wondering who this who this young man is. Um, and the pig, I don't know, anonymous pig. Um, <laughs> but the idea, what we're doing in both of these what, what both of these videos is, you know, this thing is predicting whether there's a pig in the image versus whether it's just Andreas. And this is predicting whether or not it's a croissant or a coffee cup. And we're gonna do stuff like this. Basically, this is kind of the core, a core um, task that may be useful to a lot of different interactive scenarios, right? 
you have a camera that's looking for some kind of an object, right? And I'm going to show you all exam. Uh, I'm going to show you examples of this transfer learning. So one um, uh, one example you can find in Reddit, which was made by I think an anonymous person. I'm not actually sure who made this, uh, but basically this was something called "Can I hug that?" And it was a neural network trained to tell you how huggable something is. So for example, this on the left is very huggable, and this on the right is not very huggable. Um, so, and, it's, and, and basically it just took a uh, image recognition data set, created an uh, image recognition uh, um, network, and then, um, then took a neural network, uh, sorry, then took a data set of images of things that they determined are huggable. So pillows, you know, yarn, dogs, you know, um, beach balls, and then things which are not huggable. So chainsaws, you know, knives, um, porcupines, you know, non-huggable things. And then basically train, uh, using transfer learning, train the neural network to convert, um, or take this, these images and then tell you which ones are huggable or not. And you could do so instead, oh good. My, uh, my cake is ready. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so. Oh, jeez. Okay, one more minute. Let's not forget about this. Someone, if like I forget, just tell me in a minute, like, because we'll we'll definitely. This is this is really, yeah, it's really risky. Anyway, um, because I'm um, yeah, limit limit limiting the computer. Okay, so um, what else? Okay, this was in my original class here. This is a student, uh, uh, former student. Maybe some of you even know. Um, uh, named Chino Kim, who basically used this technique in the following way. Um, he basically took a pair of glasses. Um, this was in this was in Motherboard, actually. I think it, uh, Motherboard is that a publication? Right? Yeah, this was in Motherboard. He basically took these beta blockers. They're glasses that um, fog. You can make them fog automatically. And so he trained the camera to fog whenever he was looking at a computer screen. Um, so looking at a screen or looking at a phone, they would fog automatically, and when he wasn't, that they wouldn't, right? So he was making it so that it would it would only let him look at things that weren't screens. And this is 2016 too. This is before there was a huge uproar against screens. I think I want to say um, so. It's very prescient, you know, ahead of its time. So that's one cool thing. Um, this is also made by students of mine who um, basically took a piano and then dismembered it and put it like a robotic arm that would play the, the strings. And then there's a TV hooked up to it and the TV was playing the movie Die Hard, um, the one with Bruce Willis. And then basically they trained it to recognize explosions. And whenever, the, whenever there would be explosions in the movie, the piano would begin to play itself vigorously. So, like, um, so yeah, Piano Die Hard it was called. Uh, Seth Krenzler, not a student of mine, but he was a student here, basically took a camera and then trained it to detect whether things could be recycled or not. So recyclable objects or trashable objects. And so this is called neural recycle. And you know, this is the kind of thing that you can imagine very easily becoming a real product. Um, you know, it was kind of used as a joke a little bit. He made it recognize uh, phones as trash, but, um, but you know, it's also like very close to a real product. And I think there even is startups that are doing this kind of stuff. Okay, this is done. Let me just quickly uh, double check that now, find MP4. So this is the first half of the video. And we take this this uh, linear function, this It's a F little clip, I think the microphone is too loud. But literally like how, which percentage of, of ugly. You know, okay. it's just that this it basically, uh, this cheap one. Good. Um, so now I can actually erase that gigantic screen flow. Right, um, out, find screen flow, and then delete. And I hope this, like that thing is still, I just want to double check it's fine. It's a pulling layer which will take everything and downsample it. Clipping. So now very, filter it out. Very bad. But okay, that's not so bad. We have, we have the, a record of the class. Now, I'm going to clear it, and now we should be good to go from here. So now there's like enough space on this. Um, no? No, wait, that's not right.
What? Yeah, I read 40 gigs just a second ago, didn't I? Am I dreaming? Let me do a quick thing just as a sanity check. Stop recording. Cache memory. That's the great killer. Okay, and now it's not even. No, yeah, now the now it's not going so crazy. Great. Um, I th and that's recording, right? Yeah. Seventeen seconds. This is here. Okay, cool. All right, sorry about that. <clears throat> I'll figure something out for next week. I'll like. I think I think it was recording too high, and uh, or bring a hard drive or something. Okay, so yeah, neural recycle. Okay, another cool project. This was made by um, a student at CAID a couple of years ago, who's a friend of Andreas's named Bjorn Carmen. And this is really cool. Uh, this was in Creative Applications. Basically, he made a little device that he called the Objectifier. And it had a small camera inside. And um, it was connected to a phone application that would let you record images. And so you would record images of what you wanted to distinguish between on the, on the phone. Um, and then it would basically do a binary classification that would then be hooked up to a um, to like either a switch button or um, something that would basically allow you to turn appliances on or off. So uh, a switch, more or less, it was connected to a switch. So for example, um, you could he had a video about this. Like basically, you could train it to turn appliances on or off according to different scenarios. So for example. We'll go later. So as long as he's doing this, it's playing music. Stops. Okay, he shows like when it's not so good actually. Okay, while she's holding the cup, it stops. I don't need to train it that much. Okay, yeah, so she puts the covers over her and the light turns off. He puts on his safety glasses. Goes on. Safety glasses off, <laughs> machine goes off. He's quite tickled by it. So that's really cool. That's called Objectifier. Really nice project. Um, these are all examples of the same thing, roughly. No, this is called Do. What? Next week? What's going on? Oh, that's. Wait a second. What's going on here? Where is. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. I put this. This, is, this should be here. Okay, so that, those are just a few examples. Okay, so now we'll get into our examples. So I'm going to, over the next, we'll see, like I might be able to even cover like these today. Like, I mean, okay, how much time do we have? We have roughly, like we're, okay, the, the idea is that now um, we, have, we have about 30 minutes or so left. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start these applications. We'll probably not, not entirely finish them, but we'll, they'll spill over into next week and we'll just keep on looking at them. The goal now over the next, over today and next week is to begin showing you tools that let you create image classification and image regression mostly, but also a few other kinds of, of uh, machine learning scenarios. And so now you're going to begin to acquire a whole bunch of, you know, nuts and bolts, like how to do a machine learning procedure. And what you want to start thinking about is, um, and it's pretty early still, you know, but like eventually you're going to want to use some of these for a midterm project. And so you want to think about how to embed this kind of a technique inside of whatever it is that you're already working on. Maybe you already have ideas, right? And like I said, like all of the applications we looked at, they're all, even though they all seem very different from each other, they're all doing the same thing, image classification, right? All, this one is image regression. But basically, they're all doing some sort of image discrimination and then using that information to trigger some sort of an interaction with a person, right? And so, and that's kind of what we're trying to do here, right? This is ITP, interactive something, um, telecommunications, right? Interactive something, right? So we're going to look at the interactive part and, so, and it's going to be based on images mostly, but we'll also see some others. And because everyone's kind of doing this with different, um, you know, a lot of you might be really into JavaScript, a lot of you might be into, you know, desktop applications, some of you might be into cloud stuff. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to show you 
how to do the same thing in multiple places. And they all have different qualities, and so you might you might you know prefer one over the other. But it's nice to kind of see the same technique repeated within different environments because you start to see how general it is. You know that it can apply in different environments to different to different applications. And the ones that we're going to be looking at are the following: ML5 uh, along with P5. P5 is kind of secondary in this sense. We'll be using the ML5 library, and a lot of them come bundled with P5 for the example. For drawing, although ML5 can be used by itself. Um, how many of you have taken the ML5 or uh, P5 class? Everyone, right? You have to. It's introductory, right? And how many of you have taken the ML5 class? Oh, nobody. Okay. They, they taught us some ML5. Okay. Like one, one, one class. Yeah. Um, last I think in the spring. So last semester, Yining, who's one of the co-authors of the ML5, and a former student here, she taught uh, I think a half semester class on on ML5 specifically. And I, I, I want to say maybe she'll do that again in the spring. I'm not sure, actually sure. That class will be more specifically about ML5. Um, um, but, but yeah, I'll be. So OK, so everyone has some basic exposure to JavaScript. This class is not going to be an introduction to P5 or how to code JavaScript, because we don't have time to make that part of the class. This is going to be mostly about the machine learning. So if you really get into something in JavaScript and you have some, some difficulty you know, like writing the JavaScript code, then it's then it's going to be useful for you to try to use other resources here. Um, so yeah, ML5, P5. We'll also show. I'm also going to show you the ML for AOFX collection, um, and we'll get into Runway and Weckonator. And Weckonator is kind of bundled with processing a little bit because it, it kind of makes sense to communicate that way. So these frameworks, basically. Um, just to mention, all of these except for the ML4A OFX uh, applications will work for everybody. The ML4A OFX applications will not work for you two on Windows. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, but I, I will show it at some point anyway. Maybe I'll show it next week, we'll see. Um, okay, let's see, what order do we wanna do this in? And actually, do I have any more slides in this? Oh yeah, okay, so this, this is for me to know what I wanna show you. And now I'm gonna decide what order to do this in. So I think it makes sense to show ML5 and ML for AOFX first. And um, yeah, I think we'll we'll start with ML5. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to your browser and go to the following website, um, ML5.js, or just search for ML5.js. Um, this is the ML5.js website. It's um, you can look at this later. It has a whole bunch of examples within it, and actually, a nice thing we can do um, is is actually just look at the examples that come on the website, um, which I forgot where they are. <laughs> I think getting started. Yeah, examples on this massive list. Uh, actually, let's look at on the P5 web editor. Oh yeah, there's a ton of them. This is cool. So if you if you go and you look up this examples how to, and you go to the on the P5 web editor, you'll see there's a whole bunch of examples. Um, let's look at one. Let's look at the first one. Yolo web game. Then it'll bring up the P5 web editor. And then you can click the play button. Asks you to use your camera. Usually one or two people have a problem with this, like maybe depending on which browser you use. Real-time object detection using YOLO and P5. Models loaded. Um, no objects. Okay, um, let me see what's going on here. Something's wrong. Yeah. Uh, huh. Maybe Yolo's not working. Let's try this again. <coughs> Allow. Capture stream is not a function. Okay, that happens sometimes. So some of the some of the older examples need to be fixed. It's an open source project after all. Um, how about 
style transfer. Let's look at the style transfer example. This isn't in the scope of what we did today, but but it, it's kind of cool, so why not get you excited about? So hit play. We're gonna do style transfer. So basically, this is the style image. This is the webcam image. And then click start, and it should begin to produce the webcam image in the style of the style image. And it might take a while. Um, Okay, so does anyone does this work for anybody? Oh, it is. Oh, maybe. Oh, maybe that's the problem. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it doesn't work in Firefox properly. Okay. Let's try this again. Getting started. Examples. P five web editor. Style transfer video. So it seems to be working for somebody. Hit play, start. <coughs> so this works for some people, but it's not working for me. Right? It's working for some people? Is it because you're recording? That could be. That could be. Maybe it is. Okay, fair enough. Um, so just, you know, you can play with those if you want. Basically, I'm gonna actually look up ones that I know are working, or I, I think I know are working. I thought these were working as well. Let's look at YOLO. Is it still? Yeah, the sound transfer video is working. Yeah. Oh, here we go. YOLO is working too. It's really slow. Yeah, it depends. You know, my computer is not so slow. Um, for some reason, it must have not loaded the font though, because it's not printing what this actually is. But okay, it's doing object action. We'll look at object action later. Uh, but okay, what I want to do now actually is I'm going to show you a few examples that I have on ML for A. So if you go to ML for A, I get that I O again. Um, you actually don't have to do this if you don't want. I'm just going to go through a few of these really quickly. In the demos page, so if you click demos, you'll see there's a whole bunch of links to P5.js web editor, just what we were looking at just a second ago. These are all links to P5.js web editors. So like, let's look at the basic webcam classifier. So I'm going to go click on, you see Andreas, given the peace sign. I'm going to show you this one right here. This is a really bare bones example of, of uh, image classification in the web, in the web, right? So I'm going to click play. It loads this. And now, basically, I'm going to let, train it to distinguish between two different kinds of images. So here you can see what's going on here. Um, here's the camera. And what, um, look at that, yeah. Um, so there's three of me. So um, camera feedback, yes. OK, so add A images. So A images is going to be me with the cell phone. So I'm going to click Add A image. And the first time you click it, it takes a little while because it kind of has to Let's say warm up the network. Whoa. <laughs> um, click add a image. And now I'm going to click it a whole bunch of times. And as all the times that I click it, I'm going to have, you know, let's say 40 something images, a bunch of images that I add of me holding up the phone. And now when I'm not holding up the phone, I'll just click add B image. And you know maybe I'll move around also. You want to give it a sort of diversity of images. Like the more different kinds of images belong to the category that you want, the better the better the classifier will perform. So now I'm going to click train, and it trains, and you see the loss goes down. Done training. So that was really quick, right? That was really quick. Just 116 images, not that many. And now once it's done training, I can click start guessing. Uh, <laughs> So I think it's because giraffe is class two. Yeah, so it goes, okay, if classification result is the first one, print Andreas. Otherwise, print giraffe. Yeah, fine. Like, so giraffe, Andreas. Giraffe, Andreas. Thanks, Andreas. Right? That's really cool, right? So let's look at the code really quickly. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to 
pause. I'm gonna stop this actually, and now and let's look at the code a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a very quick rundown of the basic P5JS or of the basic ML5 and P5JS code. So this is P5JS. So there's a setup and there's a draw. So you always have setup and draw. And here, let's look at the code. There is very actually it's actually very little code. So so this is really qu quite easy to set up. If you're comfortable with ML5, uh, sorry, if you're comfortable with P5JS then adding in ML5 is going to be just like a few extra lines of code and then you have an image classifier in there. So it's pretty easy to get started with if you're already pretty good with ML5, uh, pretty good with P5. So here, this is standard P5. Create a canvas. Canvas is 640 by 480, so we could draw on it. Then it creates a, a video capture device, so the webcam capture, right? Makes it the size of the canvas. And then it actually hides it. The reason why it hides it is because otherwise it would draw automatically um, in the canvas. But we want to draw it like we want to draw it separately, just for the sake of convenience. So it's hidden. And then here's the ML5 code: feature extractor equals ML5 dot feature extractor mobile net. And then it has a callback function called model ready. Right. So remember, JavaScript is asynchronous. So basically, when we call this, it's not going to actually Feature extractor is going to be null for a little while because it takes some time to download it, right? Because basically this makes it download the model from the server. And the model is actually a few megabytes, so it might take a few moments to download. And so we use a callback function to let the application know when the model is ready. Because if you try to use feature extractor before it's downloaded, uh, it'll crash the application. It'll just it'll crash the code. And so if it go, so let's look at model ready model ready is down here and all it actually does is um, it just takes it's using the dom library also select model status so what is this model status well if you look at the HTML um, which you if you click on this button you'll see there's also an HTML page so in index.html you'll see that there's a element called model status span ID so you see how it says when you doubt when you load the web page there's a little um, element that says loading base model and it's called model status and then video status is loading video right so then if you look at the code what happens when the model is ready is it takes the model status span that that uh, that HTML element and it changes the text inside of it to say base model loaded so instead of loading model it says base model loaded that's all it does. And then video ready, same thing. Like when the video is ready, it changes the video, um, it changes the video status span to say video ready. So that's all it does. So then we go, um, let's look at this. Oh, let, let me actually also, yeah. So then, now what is feature extractor? Feature extractor, the feature extractor cl um, class in ML5 is basically loading a neural network called MobileNet. And MobileNet is a neural network that was trained by Google um, to be a very, very small image classifier. And it has to be small because, okay, for example, the neural network that I loaded in Open Frameworks was something like 400 megabytes. Um, 400 megabytes is, you know, you can't really like expect someone to download that on for ra a random website with an image classifier, right? Uh, but it turns out the 400 megabytes, you can actually make neural networks which are which are like 70% as good as 400 megabytes that are only like 5 megabytes. And there's a whole bunch of tricks to, to doing that, mostly involving making the, the fully connected layers really small or making or, or, or representing the networks with less precision or binarizing them. There's a bunch of tricks. But basically, MobileNet is this neural network that does image net classification into a thousand categories but has uh was that me no, no. <laughs> oh i thought i turned on siri um so so yeah um it it um what was it saying oh yeah mobile net is a neural network that that basically it's like five megabytes so you can expect the user reasonably to download a five megabyte model even five megabytes for the web is kind of like personally i think that's too much but for machine learning you're like okay five megabytes you can do um, okay, and then it loads it, and then it creates a. It, then it takes feature extractor, and uh, feature extractor. All it does by itself is it extracts features. It doesn't actually do any classification on it. It just gives you a feature vector, which is I can't remember how big it is. I think it's like 128 
numbers, I want to say. But I might be wrong about that, I don't remember. Um, but the point is that it's a represent it gives you a representation of the image um, which captures 128 statistical elements. And those represent different the presence of different high-level features, um, which come before the classification. So um, so they're kind of a little more general, which is nice because we then they can be reused for different classifications, uh, different categories, right? Um, and, and so you, there's classification, there's also regression, and we'll see that later. Um, so classifier equals feature extractor dot classification, and then there's this options variable, which tells it, okay, we want, we want, we want two labels. Num labels is two. That means we have two classes that we're distinguishing between. Then it calls this setup buttons, and setup buttons, all that does is it, if you look at setup buttons, it just uses DOM library to create buttons, and the buttons have different uh, functions. So when you click button A, it'll, it'll take the div button A, um, which is already in the HTML. There's, you'll see button A, and it goes, okay, I want button A. When you press, when you press it, it will add an image to, um, to the classifier, and it will give that image the label A. So the label of the image will be A, and then it'll also take the amount of images, of A images, and make that number one more as an integer. So just HTML stuff, basically. And then it does the same thing for button B, because there's two classes. And then it makes a train button. And when you click on the train button, it will train the classifier, and it'll tell you what the loss value is, and then this is the callback. And it goes, okay, if there's a loss value, it tells us what the loss is, puts it into the HTML, and then when it's done, it'll go, it's done. And then there's a predict button. So this uh, lets you turn on the classify, or it lets, it, it'll begin to predict, basically. Um, it's a Boolean, I think. Um, and yeah, there's a save and load button if you can save and load models also. Um, I don't know how that works with the web editor because maybe it saves it. I'm not sure where it saves it, but if you run it locally, it'll save it like in the root folder. Um, so, so yeah, and then, okay, let's go back to the top here. So what's going on here? Um, we created the classifier, creates the buttons, and now inside of draw, it draws the video image, right? It's doing that by itself. And classification result is a variable that if it's A, because we when it gets A prediction, it'll write the text Andreas. But it can write any text you want. So it could be like apple, banana. That makes a little more sense. <laughs> um, and maybe, okay, yeah, you can draw a rectangle or an ellipse. And... So okay, like and then and then what happens by the way also like classify is the function that gets called whenever you click the predict button, and um, and basically this will this will run it, this will classify whatever image is in the webcam, and and also by the way classifier it gets a reference to the video. You see that we pass video to the classifier so it knows where to pull the image. It's very high level. Um, and then, and then, okay. So then, got results is the callback of class of classify. So when, where's classify? There it is. So when we call classify, you hit predict. When you click the predict button, it calls this vari It calls this function, and so it goes classifier, classify, got results, and got results is the callback. So we can go back and find got results, and got results shows us. Got results will pass the result or an error if there is one. It'll pass the result and it'll take that result and it will write into the HTML. So it selects the result div and it puts the label into there. And it also tells us the confidence. You, there's a confidence value and um, overwrites classification result also. So that's this is what's being used in the draw function 
Um, and then actually it just calls classify again. So this creates a ping pong. So we call classify and classify runs the classifier and goes to got results. And then got results, once it's done, it just calls classify again. That's why it just keeps on predicting new stuff. If we, if we don't do this, it'll stop. It'll just do it once. So that might be useful. So like, like if I comment this out now and I run this again, now it'll just, instead of, it says start guessing, but it'll just do it once. So like I can be like, okay, add A images, add B images, train, and then start guessing will do it once. Banana, apple, apple, apple. Banana. No, because I had to click it, right? So I'm going to click it again right now. Oh. Click it again right now, right? So you get the idea. So, mm -hmm. but then you've got an infinite loop. The two functions are just calling each other. Well, now they're not because I, right, I commented before it out. they were. Yeah. So how does it ever call the draw? Uh, be, be, a JavaScript is asynchronous, so it's calling jo it's calling draw no matter what all the time. Oh right, because inside classify there's an asynchronous call. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I was thinking the whole thing was synchronous. So I was like, it's just thinking. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so here, like, if you do if you do leave this in, it, it is an infinite loop. Um. So maybe you don't want an infinite loop, or maybe you want a way to stop the infinite loop. You know, there's all sorts of ways of doing it. What if we want three classes instead of two? How would we do that? So it's actually, it's not too hard. We would, here we would need another, we would want another button, right? So like we would say, okay, we have to, instead of just images of A and B, we would need images of C. I mean, this is not the best way of doing this because really you want probably like an array, but I'm just gonna do, I'm just going to scale this up instead. So now, we have now and in the options we want three labels and then in setup buttons we're going to just have another button button C so I'm just going to copy this button C button C so we're going to have to change the HTML also number of amount of C images images of C++ and then, um, and then that's that's all here. And then in the draw, now we'll need a third thing. So like we'll say, if classification result is C, then uh, draw a triangle. 100, 100, 400, 100, and then something like that. And we'll say, uh, chair, I don't know. And in the HTML, we we now we have we made these h we're referencing these HTML elements for button C. We don't have them yet, so let's go into the HTML and add them. So you see now there's also this. There needs to be an add C image. So we'll just basically just copy it like this. Button C, amount of C images, add C images, C images. So I think that should work. So let's see. Run. Now you see there's another button here. Okay, so let's do this again. So with the phone. Now how about this? If I put my hand in front of it, or the um, yeah, like this, that's going to be B. And C is just me. And I think what I did was um, I put it back to the infinite loop, if I'm not mistaken. Did I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. So now I'll train it, and now it should just start doing this by itself. Chair, banana, apple, chair. So if you wanted to do, obviously, it's, this is an impression model, the Huggable thing, but if you were to do something like that where you have a lot of different uh, classifications. Would you would you just like 
Would the best option be to in P5 write some code that like that like automatically looks at all the images, or would you want to do that in a different software, or like in a different tool? Uh, I'm not. I'm sorry. So like, so if if the goal is to do something where it like let's say you wanted to recognize a hundred different objects. Yeah. Um, a hundred different objects. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, would you just do something like this, but scale it up in a way that is? Like more automated, so you don't have to literally like show it a picture of every single. Sure, thing. you can certainly do that. Like maybe you have a directory, like a folder of images, and you can set up a loop to read each image, and then load the image and then send it to the classifier and tell it what it is. Yeah, you could totally automate that. That's that's all P five. That's all within the scope of P five. I mean, I guess my question is like, is, would that be the smartest way? To I mean, it, it all depends. Like, like those are all those are all very application specific. Like, maybe you don't like the whole point of this is that it's interactively trained, so you can make something like on the fly. Maybe your application doesn't need that. Maybe it already has a particular classification that it's looking for. I, I mean, also one thing is you can save a model. Actually, we can try to save it right now. Let's see if it works. So if I go model weights dot is this for you? Yeah, okay, model weights dot bin. Um, I think it like needs the whole folder, right? So like weights. So I'll save it in here. And then it saves the JSON in here also. So there's two files. There's the JSON and there's the weights. So now if I reload this, when you reload uh, actually um stop it. Now when I stop it and then play it again. The model is gone, but I should be able to load the model, and I have to go into choose files, and I and I, I have to open both of them. I think this is really weird, sort of, but okay, open, and then um, I think it should just work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. See, I was able to save and load it. That's kind of nice. So yeah, like maybe if you if if it's if you have a very specific scenario, you could train it yourself and then just save the model and then have it loaded for the user. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, then, yeah. Because um, I mean, there is some inaccuracy here, but so if for for applications like the Objectify, does it average over? Number of frames or something like that, because um, I'll see I'll see a flicker a lot. Would, mm. you, would you be able to get rid of that kind of maybe like you could sure you you could you could try to do something like that like it gives you a confidence value for 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 it and so maybe you could have some sort of a check in the program that if the that you maybe you're you're sort of uh, like give me the confidence of class A over the last ten frames and then if it goes above a certain threshold then only trigger the action. You can do things like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let me show you a few. So we just have a few minutes left. So I want to. So we're just going to get through ML five today, and then we'll we'll, we'll do runway and ML three OFX next week. Um, but I want to show you a few more. I want to basically show you enough ML five so that you could play with it this week. Um, and so this will just be a few more minutes. So okay, like this this what we just looked at is a template. It's the simplest possible code. You saw that there's very little code there, and then from there, it's really just scaling up for it to have you know more stuff depending on what it is that you're trying to do. And you can see that if the next few of these um, examples are all just this template, but a little bit more complicated or do doing something more interesting. So, for example, if you click play guitar with your webcam, you'll see that all this that um, yeah, this is the same thing as before. Except um, it just does something besides for drawing a triangle to the screen. And it loads the sound library and it plays a guitar. So it lets us train six different classes. And then, uh, so let's do this. So class zero, class one, class two. Um, class zero was just me, right? No. Okay, so um, how about this? Class three. <laughs> Looking at my nose. 
Um, class four. Class five. Now I'll hit train and start guessing. sampling, um, whenever it receives a new classification, it'll sample from these sounds. And you see that there's just a bunch of chords, C, F, G, A minor, D minor, E minor. And it's just using the sound library, and it's triggering. So you can see that the, the difference between basically what, what we just looked at and this is it's almost the exact same code, except there's also this like sample array where it loads a sound. And then in got results, it goes OK. It receives a label called next label. And we have a variable called label, which is tr keeping track of what the label is. And if label is not the same as next label, in other words, if we get a change, because otherwise, if, if we, it'll just keep playing right all the time. Um, so here it goes, if you receive a new label, then overwrite label with next label and take that label and play it. So otherwise, all of the rest of this code is, is basically exactly the same. Pretty much the same. So that's really cool, right? Like, there's an application. Here's another application. Almost the same exact code. And here, it's basically taking pictures. Um, it basically will take a picture. How does this work? It's like, well, here, let's just run it and see. Yeah. Teach me when to not take a picture. Mm -hmm. So so the thing that Andreas did was he, um, there's a funny thing that he did. He made it so that it only takes a picture of you when you prune your face, like you do this. So I'm going to do that. So basically, teach me when not to take a picture is when I'm looking normal. Okay? Do not take a picture when I'm doing this. But when I do this, do take a picture. <laughs> oh, that hurts my face. <laughs> Train. Start guessing. So, hmm, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then it saves it. <laughs> okay, maybe it's not that good. At it. Oh, did I stop guessing? Yeah, start guessing. Oh, I think it has to do it for, for a certain amount of time. There's a timer. It's like... Well, it's really hard, actually. So you got to train it for longer, maybe. You know the idea. Um, that's kind of neat, right? So, so uh, what else? Like, let's see, webcam classifier plus sound. I think that's the same thing. Classifier plus image. We're running out of time. Um, I want to show just a couple more really quickly. Just so, so now I'm not gonna just because we're running out of time. I just want to show you the examples, and then you can look at the code later. Um, this one is. Webcam classification. This is just the, the basic um, it, mobile net uh, classifier. Seatbelt. Reflex camera. iPod. Actually, a phone. <laughs> well, you get the idea, right? And then um, one more. This is what I made, which is basically taking. Oh, this is a gen regression example. So here we didn't get a chance to really see, but webcam regression 
lets you uh, mess with the slider, right? So basically, the slider controls the size of this rectangle. So let's say at zero, I want to add a whole bunch of samples. And then the more the phone, let's say the, the bigger the phone is, I want the bigger this thing to be. So I put the phone here, and it's kind of a little bit bigger. And then I'll change the slider to be over here, and I'll make the phone even bigger. And I'll make it really big, and I'll put the phone like in front of here. So now we're going to train it to sort of recognize the size of the phone in the image. So train start predicting. So this is regression now, not classification. Right? So, okay, what else can you do with that? Here, I have a generative art example. So here, it has this, like, color gradient thing. And as you change the slider, it changes the speed and the color. So maybe we'll just add a bunch of samples of me. Not too many. And then put my phone in front of the camera, move the slider to the right, add the phone. And now I can control this generative art sketch with my camera. Right? So stuff like that. And you'll see that the template is basically almost exactly the same. OK? OK, so it's 620. Let's, um, let's call it a day. And, and let me just, a few more things before you leave. Basically, like, I'm going to do the rest of these next week. And also, we're going to talk about how neural networks are trained. And I'm going to show you a bunch of the ML for OFX stuff. Um, so yeah, there's, there's uh, some more of this stuff. Uh, assignment, uh, assignment-ish. Basically, what I'd like for you to do is just like play with the ML5 examples. Try to maybe like to the extent that you feel comfortable, try to maybe like make one of your own in the p5.js web editor. You can just copy, you can fork them and save them. So you can just like start doing stuff with them. And um, and also this is kind of optional, but you might enjoy it. Um, if you go to ml4a.github.io, click on ml4a, you'll see these three chapters, neural networks, looking inside neural nets. We've already basically talked about this today. So if you feel like reading a little bit more about it, there's a little bit more detail. Like this will give you some insight. These are book chapters that I wrote a little while ago. Neural networks are looking inside neural nets. And then we're going to do this. Oh, and also convolutional neural networks. And then we're going to do this next, next week, how neural nets are trained. If you read it, you'll get a little head, a head start in it. So maybe that's something you want to do. Um, these, this should all be lucid reading for you. Okay, so um, yeah, so see you next week. I'll have office hours tomorrow, so definitely feel free to like drop by. And um, yeah, that's all. And I'll post this, and I'll let you guys know. Okay, see you guys. Thank you.